All right, I hope you can see the screen. Okay, thank you very much for having us and uh, allowing us to introduce our time-sensitive networking solutions um, today. So we heard a lot of stuff about uh, industrial Ethernet and the different flavors of it. So now we're heading to another one, basically, which is time-sensitive networking. Um, first, I want to say something about uh, NetTime Logic. So we are still kind of a startup, even though we're, f we're founded in uh, 2015. We're based in Zurich, Switzerland, and we're concentrating on FPGA-only implementations of synchronization solutions, network redundancy, and uh, time-sensitive networking IP cores. We're FPGA vendor independent, but also, of course, support Intel um, FPGAs. We have about 20 years plus FPGA firmware and uh, embedded software design experience and are involved in a couple of different standards, standardization groups, especially in the time synchronization and network redundancy and TSN area. So what we provide are FPGA-based solutions for, as I said, synchronization, network redundancy, and real-time Ethernet. And we have their FPGA IP cores and also do software and FPGA design services if you not only want to use our IP cores, but also want us to connect it to your real application. So that will be the content. Um, since TSN is still new, I first want to show a bit what is TSN, why we want to have TSN and how it actually works. Um, that's especially um, needed for the demonstration later on, so you see, know what you're actually seeing. Um, then, yeah, if you hear time-sensitive networking, you also hear a lot of times OPC UA. So I want to show you how TSN and OPC, OPC UA go together and why the FPGAs are the best choice um, for TSN at the moment and probably also in the future. Then we go through the implementation of our TSN solution and do a live demo how that whole thing works. So first, what is TSN? Um, yeah, it's an extension to normal Ethernet, which is basically the same as the other um, real-time Ethernet solutions that we have, like the Profinet and Ethercat and all those that we heard before. So what you need for uh, deterministic uh, Ethernet is basically synchronization, prioritization, determinism, and bounded latency. So you know, need to know how long a packet goes through your network. High availability is also a key thing if you have um, for example, medical devices or uh, are in the airspace area or something like that. And the big thing which comes with TSN is you want to connect the process network, so your real factory floor, with the office network and actually want to connect it to the cloud and all with the same network without having additional bridges in between. Another thing why we want TSN is we want to end the war on field bus communication. So that started like 40 years ago uh, with the serial communication buses, which we still have with CAN bus and all that. Um, then generation, well, then th that was still more discretized than we had the CAN buses. Now we still have all those Profinet, Ethernet, PowerLink and all those real-time Ethernet um, systems and now we actually want to go for a converged solution which will be the time sensitive networking approach so what we really need is actually having ethernet in all those uh, production lines and basically industrial ethernet took over all the field buses in 2018 so um we have the trends to Ethernet, which is basically the base for TSN. And we have a very strongly growing market there. So there was like 64% growth in uh, industrial Ethernet still also in 2020, which was kind of a special year. Um, what were the drivers for TSN? So 
all the real-time Ethernet protocols that we have of today are basically driven by large companies. So we have Provinet, which is basically driven by Siemens, Ethercat by Beckhoff, uh, uh, Ethernet IP by uh, by Rockwell in the US. So what we wanted to have is a standard-based real-time Ethernet protocol, which is vendor independent and not driven by one large company. Also, the thing was we want to have an easy migration path from the existing networks. And basically what was the key driver for it is we need to have interoperability between most devices. So having one network for basically everything. So what the, what the goal is, is to have TSN and it shall basically replace all the other um, real-time uh, Ethernets that we had, so that there will be one Ethernet. So the Ethernet-based field bus of the future, which shall be the enabler for industry uh, 4.0 and industrial IoT. So having a vertical integration with TSN from the cloud to the factory floor and back. Um, there were more drivers, so the we heard that before. Basically, what the softing um, was telling. So you, as a sensor actor or co uh, control equipment vendor, um, needed to uh, have a solution for each of those real-time Ethernet, and that's exactly what TSN was aiming for. They don't want to have that anymore. So you basically want to have one Ethernet based field communication, one that fits all, which makes basically the development also cheaper. Um, and yeah, the customers don't need to uh, choose a specific field bus, which normally gives better interoperability if you have one field bus and not bridges between field buses. That's another thing. Um, of course, you have the option of multi-source. If you have, for example, a drive, there will be uh, multiple vendors supporting TSN and you have competition between those vendors which makes probably the drive then cheaper in the end as well. No gateways are needed so no additional devices there um, so you can really combine your IT and OT network um, together and go directly from your factory floor to the cloud which reduces also the complexity. Now, it's not that easy. So it's not TSN is one standard that uh, defines everything. So it's a, really a set of IEEE 802.1 standards, which together form um, TSN. And one important thing to mention is TSN only uh, defines uh, the layer two functionalities in the OC model. So to start, uh, what is the common sense of what is TSN? So basically, you need Ethernet as your transport uh, medium. You need time synchronization. You need traffic classification. Um, so you define what is important traffic and what is not important traffic. And then you basically schedule your traffic into cycles and time slots. So shortly, the standards I'm going through, just to give you an idea of what uh, um, what are the most important ones and what do they do? So we have IEEE 802.1Q. Um, probably everybody's familiar with that. That's VLAN. Um, VLAN basically defines which you have their priorities and basically those priorities define which traffic shall be important and for example having a cyclic manner or, or just best effort traffic so you really can distinguish between high priority traffic low priority medium and all that so it is the base standard for tsn and all other standards are basically addendums uh am amendments for those standards um like the scheduling and this time synchronization and all that so 802.1 as is the time synchronization standard um since we are working with cycles and time slots, it's important that every device in the network is synchronized. 
and 802.1 AS is a profile to IEEE 1588 and allows you to have sub microsecond accuracy uh, in synchronization over, or, over your whole network. And that's already widely used um, also in other real time Ethernet protocols. So that's basically nothing new. Then this standard, the IEEE 802.1 QBV, is the scheduling standard. And that's basically the one that actually defines a real-time Ethernet because it divides um, time into cycles and time slots. And what it does is it, allow, it um, tells us when each traffic class, which you have defined during uh, with the 802.1 queue, with the VLAN tags, um, when they are allowed to send and when they are allowed to forward traffic. So you can really um, have slots where only hyper traffic can go through and uh, there are slots where um, best effort traffic can go through. So they're separated completely in time. Of course, this can change the order of frames. So how do they do it? They have a list in, uh, of entries uh, which say when which uh, priority class is allowed to send and for how long. So what we we see in in that uh, diagram is the th like three different kind of schedules. So the simplest one is the first one up here. Um, which basically is exclusive traffic. Um, each traffic class um, has its own time slot when it's allowed to send, and that's it. Then you can have overlapping uh, um, schedule where one is still allowed when the other one is also allowed to send. So then you have basically strict priority scheduling as well during that phase. So if a high priority traffic still wants to send, it will, will be still allowed um over the reserved phase for example and then you can have multi uh, cycle uh, multi cycles within one si normal cycle with overlapping and so on you can make your schedule as complicated as you basically want um yeah so there are normally numbers of hundreds of entries that you can hold into your uh, schedule list and that gives you basically a possibility to whatever schedule you need to do. Um, then there was another uh, standard that came in, which is preemption. Um, this means a higher priority frame can interrupt a lower priority frame. And that really means like the frame already started, you stop it, uh, send your high priority frame in between and continue with the fragments uh, with the uh, remaining part of the other frame. So this is basically used when multiple traffic classes are active at the same time or if there is no scheduling done at all, um, then still a high priority frame has uh, basically a bounded latency um, from one node to the other one or over the whole network, you know how long it will take to, in worst case, to get from A to B. Um, they use some special preambles and start a frame delimiters on a frame and the modified uh, redundancy check to figure out whether it was a, a real end of a normal frame or whether the frame was interrupted in between and will be continued in, later on. What they still do is the minimal frame size is preserved. So basically it's still a valid Ethernet frame on the cable. Um, so you cannot cut off uh, a frame after two bytes. You really need to make uh, uh, the minimum size, which is allowed by Ethernet, which is 64 bytes um, before you can really cut. But still you get a bounded latency, which is much shorter as, of, uh, as if you would send like a, 1500 byte frame and it has to wait for that. Of course, this will change the order of the frames. So just a small example, um, a couple of different queues want to send frames uh, um, at the same point of time. Um, a low priority frame started a bit earlier and then high priority frames want to be sent. So this is cut at the earliest possible point. 
all the high priority frames go through and then the low priority frame is continued then another continued and the frame four had to wait a bit because uh, the low priority frame just started and is not large enough that it's 64 bytes so and then it is sent and then frame five and frame six which are low priority frames were continued um, Another uh, standard, which is 802.1 QCH, it makes basically cyclic forwarding. Um, this is uh, used if you really want a very deterministic um, window, how long it shall take through, uh, for a specific frame uh, from uh, one point to the other, and you know exactly uh, on the number of nodes between two points where you want to know, um, the number of hops define uh, the maximum latency the frame will have because it for each hop, so each switch basically, um, it takes one cycle uh, for forwarding the frame. Um, that's not really useful, for example, for robotics where you have uh, um, a control loop but for other things, it's really important that they have deterministic latency, and it's not really that important how lo uh, that it's a longer time, but it needs to be deterministic. Um, yeah, that's just an example. I'm skipping that. Um, then there are more standards like uh, 802.1 QAV, which is a credit-based shaper. Um, it has basically two functionalities. It avoids burst uh, of the same traffic class, so you're not send overloading, for example, your receiver. And um, also, uh, it allows between different traffic classes uh, to change the priorities. If one sends too long, uh, that the other one doesn't starve. Then, there is, for the redundancy, there is another standard, 802.1cb. Um, it is a seamless redundancy protocol, which means um, you have zero loss and zero switch over time. It duplicates frames on sending and on the receiving valve, um, it just drops the first, um, uh, receive, uh, the, just takes the first frame and drops the second one. Uh, it does that by tagging some Ethernet frames and this can basically used, uh, be used in a ring structure or even with separate networks or meshed technology. Um, and yeah, it's basically the same concept that other protocols like uh, HSR or PRP um, used in a IEC standard, and it was just re basically re-standardized and open standardized by the IEEE in that case. Um, one important point for TSN to work smoothly is configuration, and that's probably going to happen with NetConf and Young. So how you configure your network, how you configure your schedules, which uh, protocols shall be active, which shall be disabled. Um, there are basically multiple schemes how to do that, and NetConf Young will probably be used to uh, configure the network infrastructure, so the switches, the schedule on the switches, and OPC UA will probably be used uh, on the end nodes. Just the reason for that is that if you already have OPC UA, you can also use that for configuration. That's a big topic in the test beds and standardization since that's not still not completely through how end nodes and switches shall be configured um, as one large network. So, and now, <laughs> so we have seen there are a lot of different standards, a lot of different functionalities, and each of the standard basically uses it, uh, can do that functionality, and you can combine them to a really powerful tool set um, to have scheduling with preemption and all that. Um, but it really depends on the application, which then standards you require. And yeah. If you have the choice, somebody has to define what is really mandatory. So um, currently there are uh, stand, uh, profiles in standardization which define which of the substandards are really necessary. So there will be a profile for automation, uh, for automotive, for aviation, and uh, yeah. 
those will define which standards are mandatory, their parameters, their cycles, and so on. All right. Um, yeah. As I said at the beginning, TSN only handles OC layer two, and unlike Provinet, which also has the application layers defined, and we've seen a lot of the tool sets before, um, that's not what TSN defines. TSN only handles the OC layer two. Um, but the companies which have already their field uh, industry real Ethernet uh, buses, um, they made the way to integrate TSN as their layer two layer um, for um, to, uh, but still keeping their application layer. So basically what we have is there is a scheme like Profinet over TSN, there is a scheme Circus over TSN, Ethercat with TSN, they're not porting that to TSN, Ethernet IP over TSN or CC link over TSN. So basically replacing the layer two part and keeping the higher level application part and APIs that they already have. So there is an open standard alternative for the higher levels and um, that's basically the open platform communication unified architecture which uh, will replace in the future the proprietary higher layers of the existing real-time Ethernet protocols. So there's a close collaboration between the TSN working group and the uh, OPC foundation, and together they build a complete field bus solution with TSN as the lower level and OPC UA as the higher level. Um, yeah. Now I hand over to Thomas. Okay, yeah, I will give you a short overview um, how TSN can be combined with OPC UA. Um, yeah, OPC UA mainly defines uh, two things. These are the transport mechanism and also the data modeling. Um, there are two different communication schemes which are used in uh, OPC UA. One is the client-server communication, which is really a point-to-point communication which will be most probably used then for uh, configuration parts in TSN. Uh, the second one is the publisher and subscriber mode. There is the idea that you can uh, subscribe uh, or publish one stream and subscribe it at many points. So this is then also really the way how it can be used uh, for real-time data. Okay. Um, yeah, OPC UA is a. Uh, can you mute that? Sorry. Um, OPC UA is a uh, still work in progress, but uh, most of the functionalities are already there. Um, this is, for example, the publishing subscribing mode, or also uh, some security features which allow uh, encrypted uh, stuff and uh, yeah things like that. Um, there are different implementations on the market available, uh, for example, uh, common er commercial stuff like the one from Unified Automation, but there is also um, there are also some open source um, uh, variants there. This is, for example, the Open6250 for one uh, stack, which is uh, very well maintained, and uh, we will also a bit focus on this one in the following slides. Um, the implementations are available for different programming languages and also uh, can be uh, ported to different platforms. Um, as already mentioned, we will focus uh, here a bit on the 6241 uh, stack. Um, it has many benefits. Uh, one is that it's really the best maintained open source stack. Uh, there are many contributors. Um, there is also commercial support available which uh, can help also a lot for uh, your specific uh, adaptations which uh, might be needed. Um, there are also a lot of different examples already available. Some of them are already targeting uh, TSN. Uh, for example, this is uh, some kind of real-time publishing with interrupt uh, or uh, higher performance uh, publishing modes uh, which are supported by the stack. 
Um, the stack is also very portable, scalable, and it's possible to uh, create it uh, as a very a very small footprint. This might be important uh, if you have uh, just a low power CPU as an iOS 2, which, we, which I will show you later. Um, partially, it's already certified by the UPC UA Foundation. Um, this is, I guess, only uh, for the client-server uh, part at the moment uh, case, but I guess they will push it also for uh, publishing and subscriber mode. Yes. Okay, um, uh, NetAnalogic has uh, done a port of the stack uh, to an iOS 2 softcore CPU. Um, uh, this is based uh, on the TransCyclone 10 uh, ref kit, which uh, you have seen already before. Um, we have done a port of the free Airtos uh, with light white IP to the NIOS 2 um, CPU. Uh, this port is uh, available uh, on a public GitHub, also with the complete sources of a small uh, demo application and pre-compiled uh, stack library so that you can easily uh, try this uh, by yourself. Um, on the bottom, you can see how the system is built up. So we have basically the NIOS 2 uh, softcore CPU, uh, where is free Airtos and light white IP stack uh, is running, uh, combined with the Open 62541 uh, stack. Uh, the Avalon bus is then connected to uh, scatter gather DMAs um, and uh, soft uh, MAC implementation in the FPGA um, to the Ethernet file. And this allows them to uh, send out the frame directly. And there are some other uh, ports included, like timer, JTAG UART, uh, block RAM, the SDRAM controller, and so on. So uh, this is uh, how the setup is built up. And as already mentioned, you will find there a complete uh, blog post about the implementation. And also there you will find the links to the to the Quartus project and all the sources uh, which you need to build it by yourself. As already mentioned, the PopSup aims really to cover the time ten, uh, deterministic connectivity part. Uh, so this is not uh, the case if you have the client server uh, variant where you're really polling uh, the, the variables uh, in your OPC UA stack. Um, as already also mentioned, uh, the stack supports different real-time modes. So they are such modes which are very performant and um, yeah, allows uh, to publishing in a quite high uh, frame rate. This has also some drawbacks that you cannot uh, fully access the variable field, for example, uh, via UX expert. So it's not that easy to supervise them uh, in a different way. Uh, but on the other hand, it's really performant, and this is most uh, most time also the important stuff there. Um, it also supports a custom publishing handling. This means uh, that you can really interrupt record uh, publishing the frames. Um, this is quite important when it comes to TSN, where you would like to have uh, the publishing uh, perfectly aligned to the TSN cycle and phase. Um, this then also allows you to uh, really uh, uh, use the maximum bandwidth uh, which is available. So these are really nice features which uh, the stack is supporting. Um, and as already mentioned, everything can be implemented in FPGA. So it's a highly integrated solution with a very small footprint. Um, of course, it has some limitation when it comes to the performance, but uh, yeah, it's so uh, I would say quite impressive what you can achieve with an iOS 2 CPU. Um, here you can see the block diagram, how such an implementation could look like. Um, so you can uh, build in the complete system in uh, QSYS, where we have uh, here on the right side a uh, NIOS 2 system uh, connected to a Mac. Uh, then the Mac is connected via interface adapter to our TSN EndNode uh, solution. Um, so the whole traffic uh, which you are generating by the NIOS system is going through our EndNode. Um, there you can also see uh, the PTP ordinary clock, which is the uh, responsible port for the time synchronization, uh, and then also the port which is going out uh, towards the PHY. Uh, on the top, you can also see the adjustable counter clock, uh, which we are using uh, internally in the FPGA to uh, adjust the time, uh, which is uh, provided uh, via PTP. 
Uh, and then you can see with the dashed lines also a signal generator. Uh, this uh, gets the time from uh, our clock, so it's perfectly aligned with the cycle times uh, of our TSN core, and uh, it allows to uh, generate a trigger, as already mentioned, to, uh, to publishing frames. This is not absolutely mandatory. You can also uh, generate your frames by just a timer internally, but to achieve the best possible uh, alignment with the phase and cycles, uh, this is the preferred solution. Okay, now I give a hand over again to Sven. So yeah, um, we've heard a lot of your OPCA and TSN. Um, so a couple, yeah, it's already two years ago where um, the bigger companies, so talking Siemens, um, Rockwell, ENR, and so on, the ones that drive the other Ethernet, real-time Ethernet standards, um, uh, made a commitment that they actually want to migrate to TSN and OPCUA and they basically showed a path how they do that uh, want to do that first of all they want to do gateways uh, between the existing real-time Ethernet solutions and the OPCUA over TSN so this is already partly done so there are already products that allow to do um, uh, connecting, uh, for example, Provinet network with a potential TSN network. Then they want to replace the lower layers of the existing real-time Ethernet solutions with TSN. This is also partly done, as we heard, Provinet over TSN, that exists. Um, and then in a yeah, later stage, um, they want to replace the higher layers of the existing real-time Ethernet solutions with OPCOA or make it coexistent which will probably be the case for a lot of installations that were already in the field. So to say that, the way is basically open for TSN OPCUA field installation. I need to click, yeah. So for migrating um, towards TSN, the priority number one is really interoperability. The whole ecosystem will only be successful if interoperability is basically guaranteed. And for that, there are several TSN test beds to test interoperability. So there's the Industrial Internet Consortium TSN test bed, um, LNI, UOI made a test bed. And uh, of course, there is the University of New Hampshire uh, Interoperability Lab TSN test infrastructure where you can actually certify your devices for TSN uh, comparability. So now, why are FPGAs uh, or system on chip solutions the best choice for TSN? Um, some of the TSN standards are still in a draft state or are work in progress. So there are more standards coming, more functionalities added. And um, yeah, there are already some ASICs, but they only support uh, quite a small set of the finished standards. So you don't want to do an ASIC on a draft. Um, standard. Um, so it, with FPGAs you can easily adapt to standard changes and of course you can also extend your um, solutions with the upcoming standards and functionalities. I had a short look at, uh, at the standard legislation groups and uh, yeah currently there are 15 plus drafts of new standards and amendments to the TSN standards. Um, so yeah there will be more features and changes and um, yeah, with FPGAs, you are covered, you can adapt. Um, with ASICs, you probably can. Um, that's one point. Um, then, of course, uh, you have a lot of resources and can do a lot of parallel things with FPGAs. So you can have actually real-time data talkers and listeners with very short cycle times. Um, talking about 15 something microseconds or even less. Uh, we had one uh, interesting company that wanted to go down to five microseconds. Um, yeah, even that is uh, possible with an FPGA and very challenging in software. So you can probably do that, but uh, I'm not sure whether you want to connect the i7 or higher end CPU to a small gas pressure sensor. Um, yeah, it's sometimes 
too expensive and you need a powerful CPU or it's just not feasible with an uh, operating system which has interrupt latency and jitter and so on. Um, with an FPGA and especially with a system on chip, you have tight coupling and you can achieve high data rates uh, with like basically minimum effort. So yeah, coming to system on chips, you have uh, tight coupling and you have a lot of data that you can feed through CPUs uh, to the FPGA and back. Um, and what you can really do is having the hard real time part in your FPGA and um, the soft real time part uh, basically running on your CPU, like configuration of docs, uh, or of your stack and your uh, network and then really having hardware FPGA based real time talkers and listeners that send or receive traffic. All right. Um, I want to show you how our TSN um, solution looks like and how we built it actually, um, because that's like a really interesting point how our architecture uh, ended up. So we started with a, with a 2.5 port switch. Um, uh, Christian said uh, three port switch. I always say 2.5, one is the uplink and two forwarding ports uh, to the um, uh, to the actual network. So you can either do daisy chaining, redundancy rings or trunk ports, um, basically as you like. Um, so the starting point was a redundant switch that we already have or also have as well as a product, um, which does redundancy according to HSR and PRP, has two outer ports uh, in uh, our in GMI, RGMI, MI mode, whatever, and uh, uplink port uh, where you can connect your Mac and basically your CPU to it. Then we added the synchronization port, so 802.1 AS or PTP, um, to have a synchronized clock um, to the switch. This needs some additional uh, frame um, modifications on the fly, for example. Then we added priority port, so the VLAN thing, um, with different priority queues and uh, arbitration between the queues. So strict priority arbitration, which means high priority traffic uh, has higher priority over low, of course, uh, based on the VLAN tags, um, but not on a schedule base yet. Um, internally, we use all OXY stream uh, interfaces, so um, that's a standardized interface and uh, you have OxyStream in, OxyStream out, so basic, basically everywhere standardized interfaces there. Then after VLAN technology was there and we had queues, um, we added the scheduling part and the cyclic forwarding part. Um, so now we are scheduling not only on strict priority but also on a timely manner, so we get the time we know which priority queue is allowed to send and which not. And we know which cycle it is, whether we are allowed to forward that frame already or need to wait until the cycle finished and sending the next cycle for a cyclic forward. Uh, then preemption was added. So there we have an interface adapted to the physical layer chips. Um, so because the preemption happens really close to the physical layer, um, we say uh, which uh, starter frame delimiters and preamble we want to send, and then there is uh, the preemption unit which says, okay, now we're stopping the previous frame and uh, sending a high priority frame in between. And on, on the other side, of course, we have the merging part which puts together the, the split frame again and um, sends it further and extracts the high priority frame for, uh, in between. Then we had a credit based shaping in parallel to the scheduler. Um, so we know whether even if uh, priority is allowed to send, uh, whether the credit based shaper also says, okay, now you're still allowed to send or you already used your bandwidth um, and give priority to another queue basically. And then finally, we added some ingress filtering, um, so you cannot overload your network on the other port, basically. 
So this was the layer two part, and now we're coming through layers, to the upper layer parts. Um, we have some additional multiplexers in here, which allows uh, to have, uh, for example, high priority traffic be um, fed to a real-time listener, or the other way, from a real-time talker to feed in directly um, uh, data within the FPGA. And of course, then we had the path up to the OPC UA stack and, and basically an application which just sends some data. So this is basically the whole system. You have your OPC UA application part up here. You have some real-time talker and listener down here to have really data on uh, low uh, low cycle time, so very short cycle times, and then the whole TSN part uh, below. So this approach has like several advantages. As you've seen, it's really split up. So you can, we first of all, we could uh, add features step by step, uh, which reduce the complexity during the, uh, the development. But also this clean separation between features allows to leave away some features if they're not needed for a specific profile, for example. Uh, automotive and aerospace do, don't have the same uh, requirements as the industry and vice versa. And we had clean interfaces in between the modules. So we can remove one and just connect the other parts which are still needed. And of course, the whole design there can easily be converted to a single port device. It doesn't have to be a switched end node, which for also forwards. Um, which uh, we will show later on. So we have an EndNote implementation on the uh, Cyclone 10 LP kit there. And of course, this is also future-proof. So we can add more features, um, add more ports, of course, uh, but also add more standards, um, just as another like small module that we add somewhere in between if it's required. The nice thing about uh, that approach is that we can basically connect our TSN solution to whatever Mac or CPU. Um, as long as it has some MII, GMI or GMI interface, we just can connect there and take over the TSN functionality really in our core. So the scheduling is part of that and the CPU just sends the frame in whenever it can and we are sh scheduling it for the network. Uh, the whole thing can also run uh, as a pure FPGA solution, so you don't even need the CPU. You can have your talker and listeners also directly in the FPGA and don't even connect a CPU to it. So now we're coming to the demo part. Yeah, the board we've already seen. So what we have on there is basically one TSN port going to the network, one uplink port. Uh, a pulse per second, which is uh, the common way in, P in the PTP world how to um, to measure the accuracy of the synchronization. And then we have here some IIC uh, application lids, which is just a running lid with a pulse width modulation of the of the brightness. And yeah, a UART. Of course, we have a UART. Uh, we are talking to our uh, IP core uh, in there via the UART interface. Um, so we can do on, uh, on the fly modifications of schedules or stuff like that. We'll show that later on. So how will the setup look like? So we're having two boards, uh, two of those uh, LP10 kits. Uh, we have a tool from our side, which is called PPS Analyzer. So that takes two pulse per seconds from those two nodes and show how accurate they are to, uh, synchronized to each other. Um, this one has a IIC talker, um, which is basically sending the LED patterns to the listener on the other side. And that one just shows the received data stream on, on those LEDs. Um, then we have a non-TSN port, which is forwarded to the TSN network, um, where we connected a non-TSN aware switch. So we are showing the converged network here, where we have an IP camera. And on the other um, 
non-TSN link, we have uh, connected a normal PC, which runs another tool from us, which is the TSN analyzer, which shows you the timely occurrence of the frames in here. For that, each frame which comes uh, uh, is received on that port will get an additional trailer um, at the end. So we have highly accurate nanosecond resolution timestamps um, to show you the timely occurrence of the frames. And yeah, that's just internals, how it's located. So this is the um, talker part, uh, which runs on that co uh, on that board, and that's the receiver part, uh, the listener part, which runs on the other board. All right, let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, first of all, yeah, that's our GUI, for example, to configure the different nodes. Um, and first wanted to show you that. So we have a talker, we have currently a 500 microsecond uh, cycle time. Um, red uh, lines here are, uh, I can show you it in frames, that's probably easier. Yeah, it's only frames now. Let's do bytes. So um, our talker sends, yeah, 200 byte frames um, every 500 microseconds. And the green, in, that's the red lines. And the green lines, what you see is the IP camera currently, which just sends basically randomly um, some, some data, which we see here. It's an IP camera. Yeah, Thomas was just going there and uh, moving his hand there. Um, then here, I don't know whether you can really see it. There is some red LED pulse with modulated, uh, changing its brightness and running from over every three LEDs. Um, so this is the traffic that is going on right now. And um, to go back to that, um, so currently there is no priority enabled, there is no phasing enabled. Currently it's just doing synchronization and, sorry, and ba based on the synchronization, those 500 microsecond cycles are started. So the real-time talker is triggered by a pulse generator as we have it before to send every 500 microseconds some frames. Um, as we've seen before, there were some bursts of, of uh, video streaming, which means, yeah, sometimes we lose some frames. They are not uh, uh, arriving at the right moment in time and so on. Um, for that, we can now start to really do priority scheduling first as, a, as the base and then basically um, do the scheduling. Now, as we've seen, it's not bursted as it was before. Now we really see uh, the frames are going in cycles. Now if we zoom in here a bit, so we see that better. And yeah, the cycle, uh, the schedule that we have here, um, I'll show you that is we are running 500 microsecond cycle times. So 500 micros, every 500 microseconds, we send high priority PVM data. And uh, for 250 microseconds, we allow high priority traffic to go through. Then we have some medium traffic, which is basically the time synchronization. We allow there uh, 125 microseconds. And then we have well, uh, another 125 microseconds um, for best effort traffic, which is basically the IP camera that we have. Um, from the gate enables that you see here, uh, it means it's all exclusive traffic. So right after the, the best effort traffic, the high priority traffic starts again. And that's what we see here. So green ends somewhere right before the high priority traffic and then the high priority traffic is sent again. And there are the gap between the green and the red that differs. It really matters when the camera decides to send some data. And the red line is really fixed right now. It just sends whenever there, uh, it, it just sends strictly on the start of the cycle. Um, then our other tool that I've shown before, so that's the pulse per second analyzer. So we're synchronized to, yeah, the scale is, 
from up here to down here plus 100 nanoseconds to minus 100 nanoseconds so we're somewhere in the range of less than plus minus 20 nanoseconds synchronized so each node knows really when to send and when to receive uh, some data and how the schedule shall look like so you really all your nodes if you forward a frame see a empty queue because of the schedules um, now in the thing i've shown that there is a load generator and i will now start that then you see the schedules even better and you say that it's affecting the camera um, but it's not affecting the high priority traffic because we're feeding traffic into the low and medium traffic area. So now the schedule looks different. Uh, no, the schedule is still the same, but uh, the frame distribution looks different. So now we have our load generator, which generates uh, some medium and low priority traffic and probably the camera, yeah, it's not even showing data anymore. Let's see whether we can still connect. Um, working on it yeah now if you move yeah he's already moving his hand before so it's really basically stuck as we see um, but that doesn't affect the red real-time traffic at all so um, we're still sending that at the same 500 microsecond um, speed and, and don't lose any frames just because we are injecting more data. Um, yeah. So that is basically what we wanted to show with TSN and really real time talker and listener and how TSN is not, a, how you can combine a non TSN network with a TSN network. So that will be your production line, that will be your office network. Um, and that is not affected whatever is done here with actual additional load and yeah now we want to go to a opc ua demo um marco can you please give the presentation rights to thomas um, i'm not sure if you have enough time because it's only two minutes left Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I have just uh, done. I can't okay. hear you, Thomas. Okay, I have just downloaded the file, uh, the software file to the NIOS CPU, so it will soon start. Um, I will also start the Wireshark capturing. Um, and you can see already that there are uh, PTP frames that are coming out since the, the, this traffic is generated purely by the FPGA, so it's not dependent on the software. Um, now you can see that the CPU is booting up, uh, some uh, configuration is done, um, uh, the UP, UPCA stack is set up. Uh, this it, uh, depends heavily on the configuration you have created uh, on your stack, how long does it take? And uh, it also depends how many nodes you have defined. So now the stack is ready and running and you see here already the frames are generated. So these are the published frames, as you can see, with the uh, VLAN Tech 5. So these have the highest priority class. Now we can also take the UA expert um, and we can connect uh, to our server. And now you can also see the frames from the UA expert. These are uh, very low priority frames. Um, as soon as you are connected to the server, um, you have the possibility to really supervise the, the data set which you are publishing. Um, here we have uh, different groups created um, and some of them are generating, uh, for example, incrementing data. This is, for example, uh, the offset, uh, which is just counting a variable, which you can see here, which is counting up. And this information is then always in the published frames. Um, we can also connect uh, to the, our universal configuration manager, as you have seen before. Um, here you can see also that we have set up a basic uh, schedule. Um, and of course, uh, the frame counter uh, should increase now with uh, the frame rate uh, without published frames. 
Um, yeah, that's basically it, what you can do. As mentioned, you have the full uh, possibilities to connect uh, to the server. So you have the full loader space. You can check uh, what nodes you have created and so on. So uh, it's really a complete implementation of uh, UPCA uh, server in the NIO CPU, uh, combined also with, uh, with the publishing subscribing mode. Here we are only publishing, but uh, you can see there is a lot possible in highly integrated system just in FPGA. Okay, then I hand over again to Sven. Marco, can you give me presentation rights again? Right, so that was that. Um, so yeah, just short, short summary. Uh, TSN, as you said, it's a set of IEEE 802.1 standards. It's an open standard. It's not driven by one big company. And it's basically just a extension to Ethernet, which adds the synchronization, determinism, and bound latency with high availability. Uh, the most important point we've shown that is the uh, vertical integration possibility. So you can really go um, to your cloud from the factory floor and allows real-time data and best effort data to go through. And that was a standard uh, IP camera that you can buy off the shelf. So it doesn't know anything about TSN whatsoever. That was really the point. So you can also connect your printer or your normal desktop PC to a TSN network. Um, together, TSN and OPCUA, we're pretty sure, and a lot of other companies are also, will be the field communication of the future. So we already see that this is going into automation, but also in automotive utilities and also in the aerospace. Fact, uh, aerospace is heavily looking at it. It's completely open, and in the case of OPCUA, it's also open source. If you go for the Open 62 for 541 stack, and there are a lot of migration plans how to connect their existing real time Ethernet solutions towards uh, TSN OPC UA network. It's a living ecosystem, as I said, and there are many prototypes available. So the future is open to having a lot of TSN networks in the future. Um, I said FPGAs are and especially system on chips are uh, currently the devices of choice for implementing TSN and OPC UA uh, just because you uh, can adapt to the standard changes and you have a tight couple which allows you having short cycles and great performance in that case. Um, and the TSN solution that we designed, as I said, it's a modular level so we can instantiate whatever you actually need and not more and um, it really depends on the application what you need so we can adapt to that and now i'm handing back i think to marco i guess <laughs> 